recording live now, Chair. OK, thank you. Um, Noswetha, good evening and welcome to the uh, liaison meeting with the community councils. Um, as is customary on these occasions, just to let you know that we are recording this this meeting and it will be uploaded onto the council's website. So the usual caveat that by participating in the meeting, you are consenting to being filmed and for these images to be used on the uh, on the council's website before we go any further. Um, so turning to the uh, the agenda for the meeting, uh, the first item is is apologies for absence. Good me apologies, Pam. Yes, Chair, I have um, two apologies um, from John Davison Bishton Community Council and Nigel Hallett from Langston Community Council. OK, thanks. Kath? Yes, I'd just like to say um, Brian Miles won't be here because he's got a One Voice Wales meeting, but Julie Foster and Judy Clapworthy are due to join. So I, I don't know if they're having trouble getting in. And we, we've got another Marshfield councillor, Linda um, Stevens, is um, going to join as well. So they will so, be along. So not so much apologies then, but uh, hopefully people that will attend later. They, well, Brian, Brian's an apology. Apart from Brian. We'll record Do Brian's you, apologies in, in, in the minutes, and we hope that your colleagues can uh, can join us later. Um, while we're waiting then, um, should we look at the minutes of, of, of last time? Um, for those who can remember that far back and, and were in attendance. So if we could just deal with them for accuracy, first of all, are there any points of accuracy that anyone wants to raise on the um, on the minutes? See lots of shaking heads. Are we OK with that? Oh, so no. are we happy to agree those as a, as a true record? OK, that's fine. Um, I was going to take matters arising at, at, at the end, but if, if we, we think that other people may be maybe joining us. Um, do you want to take any matters arising now and we'll Neil can then uh, you know present when when the others have, have joined us. So are there any matters arising that anyone wants to raise on on the minutes of of last time? It was mainly just um, an update on the legislation and, and code of conduct, but any 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 matters yeah. arising anyone wants to bring up? Not from Marshfield. OK, anyone else? I don't think there is anything from Grank, to be honest. OK. Um, well, in that case, I've delayed as long as I possibly can. So um, <laughs> at this point in time, I'll hand over to, to Neil Gunt, who's the Council's Senior Planning Enforcement Officer, um, who's here by popular request. I have to say, Neil, because uh, lots of planning enforcement issues keep uh, keep recurring at these these meetings. So by popular request, they've asked if you could just give us a, a brief overview in terms of your work and, and, and the enforcement policies of the Council. Talk with you, Neil. OK, thank you. Um, what I've done is it's a short presentation. Uh, planning can be a bit dry, so I've tried to make it a little bit more interesting, topical. Um, basically, it's a bit of an overview. I did an informal meeting with Marshfield Community Council. This goes into a little bit more detail, but I've also got some examples that hopefully you'll be able to relate to. Um, and I've tried to pick them, though I'm based in the west side of Newport, I've tried to include them from the east side as well. So it, it's, it's a bit more broader in its context. But with that, I will now try, hopefully this will work anyway, <laughs> Let's put that. Okay, I let's get rid of that. If anybody feels they want, uh, they've got some queries for me. No, don't say I'm going to fall. There we go. By all means, fire away as we go through, or alternatively, save the questions for the end. Right. OK, so I'll start with the usuals, who, what and where, and then go on to setting the scene in the broadest sense for planning and planning enforcement. I will I will cover the legislation, but not in any depth, um, but it's just again to give you an idea. And taking action, that's basically looking at some of the examples as well that we've basically recent prosecutions 
and cases that we've had around Newport. OK, so we're split into two, which I've already alluded to. Now, the east area is basically Killeen and the east side of the river. It's slightly different from the, the planning area, which also includes, I think it's um, basically Malpas and Betis. But as I say, if you think of the river as a boundary and Killeen being over on the east side, that's broadly the split. Um, my counterpart is Paul Marshall over on the east side. What I can do at the end, if people want, I can share these slides as well because there's contact details on there. Okay, basically what's covered by a planning breach? Um, the unauthorised building or engineering works, it's surprising, it can be a bit tricky sometimes over what actually does constitute or require planning permission. I mean, in terms of the Act, it's largely something that a professional person like a builder would undertake. And there's actually there's been some recent case law today because engineering works. It's a bit of a nightmare, but we would tend to say if you're using plant or heavy machinery, then you're heading in that direction. We've got non-compliance with the approved plans, which largely speaks for itself. And there's a standard condition on decision notices, which will say that blah, blah, blah plans have been approved and are part of this decision. And that's what Excuse we'll be me, looking. Neil, are you, are you moving the slides through because nothing's moving? Well, that's weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah so, we, sorry. Yeah, it's kind of pointing that out, Kath. Yes, it, it, the slides aren't, aren't moving on on your shared screen there, Neil. Right. What I will do then is, as I say, thank you for telling me that. Because I would have carried on blithely. Let's have a look. Let's see if I can share this. Now, it won't be a full size slide, I don't think. But if this works. OK. Um, Neil. If you, yes, I was going to say, if you show your screen again, well, that's what I was doing. Uh, I was sharing the screen, and for some reason, it uh, was not sharing everything with everyone. Right. Okay. Can you see that? Um, yeah. Yes, it's yes. changed now. Yeah, right. I can see that. But if you go into slideshow, I did, and that's when it disappeared. <laughs> it was working fine at this end, but you guys were not seeing it. So I think if I stick with these slides and not the obviously it's not um, as good as a slideshow, but at least you will know you're getting. What I'm, I'm basically discussing, I don't think it's necessary to recap because well, we'll say it's we don't got so far. Um, Non-compliance with the pre plans say largely is what it is. But we're looking at what would be material departures. Um, it used to be referred to as de minimis, but now we've got non-material amendments. So you're looking at really minor departures. You've got obviously non-compliance with planning conditions. That can be submission of details, how a site is run because there'll be construction management plan for the larger sites. So that would normally govern things like wheel wash, hours of operation, that sort of thing. Um, material change of use of land or buildings. Common one in the town centre would be, say, from A1, which is a shop, retail, through to something like A3, a cafe, pub, that sort of thing. Uh, and sometimes you'll get officers, change of use of a house, something like that. So it, it, it's quite broad. Unsightly land or buildings, well, it does speak for itself. If a place is very unkempt, dilapidated, overgrown garden, tipped waste, that's the sort of thing that you'd be looking at. And I've got I've got some examples of that later. So you get an idea. We're not say looking at an overgrown lawn, but 
say quantities of tipped waste, that sort of thing. Unauthorised advertisements. Now, the same. This is a bit complicated because certain adverts can be what we would say is deemed, and that is basically they've got permission. Um, but if you're looking at, say, adverts in the middle of a field is a good example at the side of the motorway. Those are the sorts of things which would be unauthorised. In terms of works to a listed building, if it affects a special character of it, and again, we're looking at beyond a repair, um, that could be both require permission, but also be a criminal offence. And then there is the unauthorised works to protect trees. So that would actually be trees that got tree preservation order on them or trees in a conservation area. Right, let's see if this works. OK, so we're on that one. OK, so we're in the Civic Centre. By all means, come in and visit us if, if you want to, to discuss something. But as I say, you can contact us either via our direct line or the contact centre, and that's the planning email address. So, right. Legislation, um, essentially for, for planning, you're looking at the Town and Country Planning Act 1990. Now, it's... It's been revised because when this came out, it was basically um, legislation that covered England and Wales, and now it's a devolved power. Um, you've got the Planning List of Buildings and Conservation Areas Act. That covers the offences in terms of unauthorised works and also what would require listed building consent. As a slightly odd one I put in is the Antisocial Behaviour Crime and Policing Act. Now, the reason for including that, though it's not strictly planning, it can be applied to planning matters. So, for example, if there was unsightly land case, and how should we say, it was a repeat offender, it basically, this can provide for a requirement to maintain a property in a set condition in perpetuity. It can also be used to tackle ad, unauthorised adverts as well, say if somebody's fly posting. So I put it in, but it's not, strictly speaking, planning legislation. And I say the key thing, though, is just because something doesn't have planning permission, one is not criminal offence. And it's not illegal. It's, it's the service of the notices that can result from it. Which, which bring about that uh, potential for an offence. Now, the overarching document, as I say, I'm quite happy to share these slides because the information's out there, is Planning Policy Wales. This is the latest version. Um, it basically sets out what the Welsh Government wants in planning terms for Wales. So it covers everything from brownfield sites, green belt development. Basically, it's in there. And then this is backed up by technical advice notes, which are a bit more specific. But to say, essentially, this is the main document that governs how we proceed with matters. Now, key one, I think, is this. Um, now, this is the, it's really dry then. They're not fun titles, I'll give you that. Development Management Manual says what it's on the tin, really. But it, it's key to see here, it is usually inappropriate to make formal enforcement action against a trivial or technical breach of control, which causes no harm to public amenity. The intention should be to remedy the effects of the breach of plan and control, not to punish the persons carrying out the breach and nor should enforcement action be taken simply to regularise development for which permission had not been sought. So generally speaking, um, if possible, 
we would encourage, if we think it's acceptable, we would encourage a planning application. But ultimately, if somebody refuses to apply, we have to basically look at this harm to public amenity. Um, and I suppose the more tangible ones, again, thinking of something like um, a restaurant, maybe, that the hours of opening are causing a public nuisance. Now, that will be something that potentially we'd want to control and we would encourage them to apply. If they didn't, we'd then have to serve notice. Now, the notice is supposed to remedy the harm. And I can think of one occasion, effectively, we conditioned it. This, there was uh, a premises that was being used as a cafe, and the only concern we had was the hours of operation, that we didn't want it operating late at night, given its location. But in every other respect, it was fine. So that's how we would tend to look at it. Now, if I go on to this is, it's normally this, this approach that first and foremost, site visit and see if there is actually a planning breach there and whether planning permission is required as such. If it is, we then go on to a 28 day letter to advise people that what they need to do to remedy it. So I haven't covered this, but say if something was permitted development and this exceeded it, we may say, look, you can either apply for planning permission or you need to basically rein it into the, the permitted development parameters. So then we would go, once we've done that 28 day letter advising them, if we've had no, no joy, they've not come back to us, we'd then go back to do a further site visit. If it was expedient, and that expediency test is basically the harm to amenity. I mean, the part of the problem is, as I say, if I use terms like harm to amenity, it's a bit. So it, I'm just trying to use examples that you'd experience, which could be parking nuisance, fumes, hours of operation. That's what it is actually referring to. So if we feel that it's appropriate, we'd then go to the 14 day letter. Um, as I say, at any point along here, it, the case could be closed as not expedient. And the final one will be site visit just to check everything's OK. If you are looking at a notice, this is a slightly different path, but most cases broadly follow this, this pattern. Um, we'll probably serve in the order of about 40 to 50 notices in Newport every year. Um, and they vary, but I'll touch on those in a moment. Right. To give you an example, um, I'm now going to go through certain types of notice and where they've been applied. Now, in terms of success here, most of the notices that a planning officer can serve can be appealed. And that would be through to PEDU, um, which is used to be the planning inspectorate in Cardiff. Now, this is one such example. Um, I think that, I mean, this would fall, I think it's in Marshfields area, but Lighthouse Farm on Beach Road. It made the popular press afterwards, and I can understand why. This had been a dwelling or a house, we think for about 30 odd years. Um, basically went to appeal, and as you can see, the appeal was dismissed in that basically their appeal was found to have no grounds. It was the act of deception here, which I say is slightly unusual because planning in many ways is is black and white. Um, you probably heard of the Fiddler case, which is the farmer who built a stately home at the back of some bales of hay in England. This was of a similar sort of thing, albeit we're looking at shipping containers and not a stately home. 
but if I go through, just to give you an idea. Now, say so the key thing was the concealment. That's what you would see if you were walking past this property. To all intents and purposes, it's a steel shed in the countryside. So, and say nothing about it screams out at you, that's a house. And this is another example, again, looking back at it. Now, I say it is slightly unusual because to say that they were claiming that it was lawful by the passage of time. Now, this would be for a dwelling, any building used as a dwelling, it would be normally be four years. But because this had been concealed for about 30 odd years, case law is that they can't benefit from that because they're benefiting from a deception. So the inspector turned around and basically dismissed their appeal. But to give you an idea from the inside, and as to say, this was taken from the popular press that got from the Guardian. So you could see basically it looks like that. But inside, to all intents and purposes, a house. OK. Now, let's move on to another example. Right, so the, the standard notice is the enforcement notice. And as you can see, there's this key phrases that keep coming up. Is there a breach of planning control? And is it expedient to issue the notice? So this is, it's that harm. It's always coming back to what is the harm? Um, and if there is a harm, the planning system is, looks to address that harm. Now, let's just move on to the next slide. Okay. Now, the key things are, so we've got to be mindful of in serving a notice is if it's not concealed, there are what we would call immunity issues that the development becomes lawful. So for a building used as a dwelling, that will be four years, but a change of use of the land, that's 10 years. And I say it, that is key for us because Normally speaking, I'll say that that first example was. Is exceptional, I guess. It's key for these to be in the time frame because to say if we miss out, we, we just cannot take action. Once they're immune, they're immune. But as you can see, the fines not insignificant. And it does allow for direct action. Now, we we have as an authority taken direct action two or three occasions. Um, it's sometimes useful to resolve a breach which we know will not be sorted and otherwise. Um, we particularly we've done it with some unsightly properties and basically forced the sale of them. I say we, we try and wherever possible to work with the owner. Um, and most people, once they realise there's an issue, it will be resolved. But the one or two diehards, and it, it can be problematic, but direct action it is, is quite exceptional. Um, so you're looking at really quite significant cases. Yeah. This is an example of a prosecution. And funny enough, it probably will have to pursue this again at some point. Um, small yard. We serve notice again. This is part of this, the delays that we experience, and it's all part of the system. It, it's that accountability that we're very used to in planning. So we served notice 9th of November 2018, but it was 4th of July 2019 that the appeal was dismissed. So you can see how the timelines are quite lengthy. Um, it, it can be a bit frustrating, but as I say, it is that accountability which is, is really good. 
Now, to give you an idea where this is, if you're not familiar, and so you can see it was for the storage of scrap and equipment and parts. So just just to stop you, Neil, I think Councillor Forsey indicated she wanted to ask a question, and she posted oh. in the chat what you mean by direct action. Right. Apologies, uh, Councillor. I I've got small screen on my laptop, and I'm not seeing requests. <laughs> so thanks, Gara. Right. Now, direct action, councillor, is is basically we've served the notice. It's effective. All the appeal process has gone through. And what we do as an authority is we do the minimum necessary to remedy that harm. So I use the example as unsightly land. So that could be repairing a roof, rainwater goods, painting the fascia soffits, things like that. But alternatively, uh, there's one example I can think of where we removed a yard and a hard standing, but it is quite costly to the authority and quite difficult to manage. So I say it tends to be exceptional cases that we do this for. Um, and so that probably mainly in terms of unsightly land cases if you could prompt me gareth if somebody does put the hand up because i can't see it yeah i'm struggling as well but if anyone else indicates i'll let you know uh it does that answer the question councillor forsey yeah can i just say so that means the council will go in and do something about it as it were um yeah, maybe, maybe for example, yeah. clear, clear, clear rubbish off off a land. Who who meets the cost of that then? Right. Initially, that would be the local authority. But what we would then do is either give the owner chance to pay the money back to the authority, and or we can force the sale of the land. Um, I say empty, empty homes is a prime example where there's a lot of derelict homes in and around Newport. So we work quite closely with that team. Um, and if they're unsightly, we can serve another notice as well, which is it's like the Section 215, but it's under the Buildings Act. And what we can then do is recover that debt in the courts. So it basically be forcing the sale of the property, but it is say we have to be accountable because ultimately it will be in the domain of the court Does I that... can re yes i, I two points if i may i can yeah, remember sure. many years ago in in north devon where i'm from a farmer built a bungalow in a field that um had no no permission for and and the upshot was the council sent in some bulldozers and bulldozed the house um, which was then left as a kind of like, oh, look at that, as she, as she went past for many, many years. And I don't know what happened eventually. So presumably that was a direct action. Um, that, that does sound like it, yes. You know, that was quite um, an, an exceptional case, I think. Um, oh, there was something else I wanted to, to say about that, uh, and it's slipped my mind now. So um, when it comes back into my mind, I'll... Um, I'll pop up again. But yeah, thank thank you for that. Thanks, Neil. Not a problem, Councillor. Now, I, I think the case in point, we have to be, again, it's trying not to damage someone's property as well. Um, and some examples, it's inevitable, say the whole structure's got to go. Um, but in many occasions, it, say if you're looking at caravans or or people, um, chattels on the land, we'd have to be careful and sort out somewhere to store them as well prior to collection. Now, if I go back on to this one that's on the new earth, now this is, say it's been prosecuted. As you can see, the fine that was in May 2021. Now, some work has been done, but it's still a breach. Now, I realised when I did this slide, if you don't know the area, this slide is not helpful at all. <laughs> um, I guess Halls Lane is here, to give you an idea. And 
you're looking at marsh field is around here and the railway is just to the south. But that's that's a plot. Um, it was used as initially as a plant to do with the gas line going through from West Wales. This is what it looks like and it shouldn't do. To say the appeal's been dismissed. Now here, this area is, I believe it's mental block now. It's either green belt or green wedge. Now that, as you can see, is almost as wide as T-Mail Lane. So the harm here is, is impact on the open countryside. So that is supposed to be about three metres wide. It's actually on the ground near four or five. And you see this hard standing around here. That should all go. And basically you're looking at where the stable block is there. Running around there, that's that's the only bit of hard standing that should remain here. It it shows that it's it's quite a difficult process because if somebody doesn't want to comply, they can really drag it out. Now, oops, just overshot slightly. Right, move on to the next one. Now, stop notices. These are again very rare. You're looking at immediate and irreversible harm. So I guess if somebody was tipping mater waste material into the triple SI, this is potentially the sort of notice that we would go down. Um, there is actually a provision for a temporary stop notice now. Um, but again, they're, they're so rare. I think the last time I served stop notices when somebody was extracting clay from the levels. That was quite some time ago. <laughs> right. So again, those are the uh, say non-compliance criminal offence. You can say findings in the magistrates court, limited in the Crown Court. Now, if we come on to the next one. Now, a breach of condition notice. I did allude to earlier. Now, this can be relatively minor departures from the plans or submission of details. Now we've, funny enough, we've recently served notice on Red Row. Um, so I say it can be from small developers through to the big guys. Now this will be for non-submission of details with regards, say a play park area, landscaping scheme, all of which would be within the remit of this. So there isn't a, a right of appeal, but the fine isn't particularly significant. But say big developers will want to try and avoid getting a notice. But to say, unfortunately, um, Retro has benefited from a couple of notices from us recently. Let's have a look. Okay, so we've got one. This was actually served on Red Row, funnily enough. Um, went through to prosecution and it was down in, I think this was over in the eastern levels. Now, this was, we weren't getting anywhere with them and this did focus their attention. But as you can see, the fines are not that high. Um, but it got their attention and we did get things resolved. Now, in the next one, this is the unsightly land notice. I rather informally had to say the test to apply. <laughs> is would you like it next to you in terms of rubbish and clutter? That's the sort of thing. It's, it's not, how should we say, we are not a best gardens um, charter. We're looking at the minimum really to make it acceptable. 
Um, there is some guidance on this, though, and it, it was produced by the former office of the Deputy Prime Minister. Again, it, it's quite good. Um, and it, it can be used by authorities to encourage regeneration in an area. If there is a, certainly a lot of these sort of re, um, derelict or redundant properties. So, OK. Now, it used to be to the magistrates the right of appeal, and it's now gone through to PEDU, which is the old planning inspectorate. This is key to all notices. There's got to be a reasonable compliance period. So we'll have to be mindful of each individual case. Um, sometimes we may differ with the inspectorate over what they feel is reasonable. But at the end of the day, it, it, you've got to justify your position and how long it would reasonably take somebody to do the necessary works to comply with the with the notice, be it a section 215 or a general enforcement notice. Yeah. This is one, this is an example. Um, this is from over on the east side of Newport. As you can see, there's a derelict car in the front garden. This is at the back of the car. Um, just masses of rubbish and waste. And to be honest, this is not the worst I've seen. Um, we tried to work with them, we served notice. Didn't work, so we prosecuted and ended up going back for a second prosecution to try and get it resolved. So it, prosecution really is a last resort. And oops, my God. Right, OK, so this is, I jumped a slide by accident. Right, I mean, this was the fine. I mean, it, it wasn't insignificant, um, but you, as you can see, the defendant didn't appear in court which probably didn't help them. Um, it's not something we want to do, but sometimes it's necessary. Um, as referring back to the earlier slide, it's not about punishing someone, it's about remedying that harm. Okay, so list of buildings. Now, in terms of a list of building, any material works that alter the character of the building can be caught and it is say strict liability offence. A lot of people will do what they think are relatively minor works. Um, again, we don't prosecute. So if we can get it early enough and intervene, we can then direct them down the appropriate route because most people, how should we say, they don't intend to breach planning control and done it by accident. We do get our serial offenders as every agency does, but the vast majority of people it's done out of innocence, should I say, or naivety, but it is a stri strict liability offence. So if somebody had done some really significant works, yeah, we probably would have to look at a prosecution. Right. Okay. So again, this is looking at the list of buildings enforcement notice. It's it's basically falls along the same lines as an enforcement notice, but it's under a different act and it's specific to list of buildings. Now this property you will probably recognize. PJ's in Newport. Now, this was combination of approaches here. Um, a lot of the minor work quite comfortably fall within what is section 215 of the Act. So things like repairing the windows, painting, removing vegetation. But there were also some significant works that needed to be done. And that's where the list of buildings offences came in. Now, this. The developer is working with us now, but it took basically this. We're looking at twenty-five thousand pound 
offences, um, which needless to say did have the desired result and focus their attention. It's a shame it had to go this far, but they are working with the authority now, which again it, it is positive and it's a shame that it it had to result in this. But as I say, for years, well, for those who know TJs, it has been derelict for probably or in a bad state of repair, disrepair for about 10 years now. Now, if I move on to. It, the unauthorised advertisements. These are sometimes you'll see them trailers in fields. Advertising something as think of an example now. On one occasion it was McDonald's, but anything can be advertised. And to be honest, they are a bit of a bane. I mean, if you're driving up, say, the M5, you'll often see them in fields at the sides of the motorway. We've got an example which we will be pursuing in Newport at the moment. And again, a fine is it's quite significant. The though it's just a strict liability offence, we still have to be mindful of a harm. So it could be a distraction to drivers, that sort of thing. So if it's in the visibility, if you're coming out of a junction and all you can see is an advert, that will be a good example. Now, next one is trees. Now, we had a recent example over in Michaelston on the Began Road. Uh, says exactly there. Offence to fell, uproot, destroy, lock. I mean, it's pretty comprehensive. Um, this particular gentleman had been tipping waste in the woodland and destroyed the trees. And give you an idea of the scale of it. As you can see, there's a OK, I know our sizes vary. You're looking, that's about 700 square metres of woodland have been damaged. Well, effectively destroyed, you know, damage is an understatement. And this had gone on for a period of in excess of 10 years. And we and we had refused planning permission for this development. Now, okay. This is what the courts had basically said, because we put this through. And this was where, again, we worked closely with our legal team um to get this and this is probably one of the first tpo sorry slipping into jargon tree preservation order prosecutions that we uh, bought in a number of years and so hats off to my colleague in legal they're really helpful with this now okay and i think we'll have to recap yeah i missed a slide again so you're looking at this example. Uh, went to court this year. Initially a thirty thousand pound fine, reduced to twenty thousand pounds. Now we'd invited this person in for an interview under caution to discuss it with them. They didn't engage with us at all, and I think this was one of the reasons why the level of the fine was set so high. Um, we've still got to remedy the harm and that will be a further notice because a change of use has occurred there, but that's moving on into a slightly different avenue. OK, so yeah, as you can see wide ranging powers. We. As a, as a team, we tend to look out for different ways of approaching things. So as I say, that community protection notice is a good example. Um, and planning, the way it operates, we consult with everybody basically, but it's also really helpful because you will get a slightly different context. Uh, I mean, for example, I'm working quite closely with Natural Resources Wales in the levels, and it's that different take um it, it's say planning is something you cannot do in isolation you really have got to speak with the other bodies 
want to identify harm and possible solutions to address that harm. I mean, some are pretty straightforward, but say if it's harm to the triple SI, then yeah, we do have to consult. As you can see, take formal action where it is expedient and in the public interest. It, it isn't punitive. It is there about resolving that harm. Um, initially, when I'd done a similar talk to this before, I was a bit concerned the courts weren't taking, well, we didn't feel the courts were taking it quite so seriously, but I've got to say my view of this is revised now. And I think it may be in defence to the courts that we're better at presenting our argument to the court. Um, and say so that fine for the damage to the trees and the unsightly land case. I think that shows that we are getting that message over in a better way. And what we try and do is we get supporting statements from people who have experience of it. Now, it can be difficult because people won't necessarily want to make a state formal statement to the court about a neighbour. But on occasion and where it's appropriate, it has been really useful. Hopefully I, I've covered it and I haven't sort of sent you all off to sleep on that. Thanks, front. Nip. I, I think Kath has just indicated a question. Kath? OK. Yeah. Hi. Thanks, Neil. And thanks for that. It was really helpful. And oh, it was good seeing the different examples and it shows how complex your work is. Um, I think that's um, something I can take away from this tonight. Um, I just mm. wondered, I know NRW, um, Steve Morgan in particular, he does present to the magistrates explaining, um, say in particular, like with fly tipping, um, how um, expensive it is to clear away the, the fly tipping. I know it's not planning, but this is just an example. And yes. he does present to the courts just saying, put, putting the organi organization's point of view across, saying how, you know, expensive, it, what it's costing the organization, um, because they're finding the penalties for fly tipping are very small. I just wondered if you had done that, or was that something that you could do, you know, to the magistrates? We, we do. Um, if it goes to a pre-trial review, sometimes I'll plead guilty and it's over and done with there and then. But generally speaking, officers do go to court um, because we are the expert. But I mean, case in point was that prosecution for the tree preservation order. Hats off to the, uh, the legal team for that. I mean, that was their their presentation in court, we had briefed them, but we didn't expect it, the person to plead guilty at that stage. So that's why we weren't present there. But generally speaking, we will appear in court. And I meant more, you know, um, outside of the courtroom um, to oh, okay. um, like present to the magistrates as a group, as a block, you know, oh, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, about your job. And because like I say, with NRW, I know they, they find the fines are, are just, it's, it's so expensive to clear fly tipping and the fines don't match the crime, basically. And I just wondered if you did a similar sort of thing um, through NCC to, to the court, you know, to the magistrates. I, I've got to say, I wouldn't be averse to doing it, but yeah. Uh, yeah. So you saw. Yeah. We've got to be careful there, Kath, because there's a limit to what we can do in terms of uh, addressing the the court's judiciary about the level of, of of sentence that they impose. But the reality is that they've got sentencing guidelines these days. The courts and tribunal service have issued sentencing guidelines for all sorts of offences, including environmental and and, and planning offences. Um, and there are certain guidelines that they, they have to take into account. And that really is why we're getting a lot of the, the increased penalties now, particularly for technical offences like planning and, and environment and, and waste offences. You know, because previously the magistrates didn't really understand those. 
So in terms of no, general no, criminal no. charges, they understood those and, and they knew the level of, uh, of, of penalty that, that had to be imposed. But they've got far more comprehensive sentencing guidelines now in terms of these technical offences. So it's making our job a lot easier as as prosecutors and enforcers for the uh, for the council um, and with NRW in terms of those those waste offences. So it's a lot easier. But no, there's a limit to what we can do in terms of addressing the judiciary outside of court in terms of, of how they send as offenders. Yeah, it was just, I know Steve Morgan, um, basically he just it's it's just like a presentation because they were finding that the magistrates weren't finding enough and basically it wasn't to influence a case but it was more as a you know generic um helpfulness that you know you need to impose stiffer you know penalties because it's n it's not deterring people from fly tipping or that's the only example I can use. But I, I know yeah. um, he told us that that's what he does. He actually goes and he presents to the magistrates, you know. So what what uh, you did and Gareth was just alluding to there, well, for uh, a prosecution that for North Rice works to a truth, we had no idea what the fine level, the appropriate fine level would be. And funnily enough, we tracked it down. There was some guidance in Northern Ireland, but none of the other home nations had any guidance on what the level of the fine should be. So we put that to the court and it was 30,000. It was right at the top. Um, so I say we, we're getting better at it, but as Gareth said, we've got to be careful. Um, and to be honest, it's it's about us telling a story. And if we can show there's a flagrant disregard for planning and the procedures that go with it, and there's a victim, that's when we will get a better prosecution too. And I think it, it, victims are, are key. And if it's just a technical breach, it can be very difficult to bring a good prosecution, even though there may be a harm attached to it. Okay, okay. thanks, Neil. That's really helpful. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yvonne? Uh, thank you. Thank you for that presentation, Neil. That was really interesting. Um, I will be sending you a case in the next hour. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, shall I send no, it to you or shall I send it to planning at? But send it send it to me, not a problem at all. Okay. The the slightly cheeky um question I was going to ask just now was um you know the Lighthouse Road case, is the planning what's the action going to be? Is there going to be direct action? Well it's it's preempting it at the moment because the inspector varied my notice to 12 months. Now, I, I think, given what I know about it, I thought that was generous. It's probably best if I leave it at that. Um, yeah, it's an interesting um, case, isn't it? I, I have a feeling it will, well, it may well end up as a prosecution at the least in that, that case. Um, I've had no approaches from them at the moment, but that, that could change. Yeah, but given, yeah. given the amount of investment in there, I think, and the fact that they went to the popular press, I, I think we could be looking at a bit of a struggle. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the trouble with the popular <laughs> press is it doesn't tell the whole story. It doesn't, and it didn't in this case. And funny enough, when I was pulling some slides together earlier, I thought The Guardian would would give a better cover for the story, but they didn't either. Um, mm. But I mean, it was Wales Online, South Wales Argus. And it, it seemed to miss the fact that this guy had deliberately deceived not only the local authority, but quite a few other bodies to the fact that somebody was living there. And that, that was key to it. Just to be generous, perhaps they don't really know the whole story. Don't know why I'm being generous to the press, but there we are. <laughs> well, but um, 
Yeah. No, that was really interesting, and I will be sending you something um, as soon as I can get the pictures together. So thank you very much. That was really interesting and helpful. Glad it wasn't too dry, I've got to say. Thank you. Julie? Yeah, hi, Neil. Julie Costa here. Hi, yeah. Hi, you. <laughs> um, a couple of things, if I may. So yeah. when you said... Uh, you talked about stop notices and them being really used and, and temporary stop notices as well. Why is that the case? Is it is it something to do with demonstrating harm or is it the process? It is it is a harm and I, um, it's the that process of demonstrating harm. Now, temporary stop notices, well, I tend to be of the view if it if you serve a stop notice, it's got to be backed up with an enforcement notice. And I feel that you should be going down that route anyway. Um, it is this issue over harm, though, because it's that immediate and irreversible. Now, I have served a stop notice, oh, I think it was about two years ago, at Tonop Hill, um, in relation to part of the site there. But again, that's fly tipping. It was next to a triple SI. It, to say they are really exceptional cases. Um, there is a danger if we get it wrong that damages could be awarded. I have to say, usually it's abundantly clear there's a planning breach, but it, it, I think the stumbling block is this immediate and irreversible element. Um, it, it's a bit frustrating, but we are bound by the legislation. Um, and I think we probably serve more stop notices than other authorities. It, it, it's it's a less widely used power. Um, I haven't covered it, but injunctions is another one. Um, yeah, it's they're fraught with their own problems and complications. The, the the shame is though is that they're very effective, aren't they? That's that's the downside for us. It, it it's the risk though, Julie, as as Neil was saying. Yeah. I mean, first firstly with a planning injunction, it's a discretionary remedy. So yeah, it, there's always the um the possibility that the, the court will decide not to grant you an injunction and, and it there's a significant amount of costs involved then. And it's the same with stop notices. If you serve a stop notice, then you can be liable for significant compensation um, yeah. if you get it wrong. And, and and that's the real stumbling block. So unless, as Neil said, it was a really uh, an emergency provision that we had to step in and stop something that was that was seriously happening very quickly, then we would we would normally go through the planning enforcement route because that way um, it doesn't open up that 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 possibility of significant damages. And, and they are quite significant. If you're talking about some commercial interests and you stop them doing something for some length of time, major developers, for example, um, you, the, it could cost the council hundreds of thousands of pounds worth in compensation because you've stopped those works in, in, in the meantime. So that's a major factor in terms of whether we serve a stop notice. It's far easier, even though more protracted, to go down the enforcement road, uh, notice route. Yeah. But, when, but when you've got cases that have gone... Uh, on and on and on where you have breach after breach after breach surely you get to a point where you know they were pretty much assured that the court are going to rule in your favor or is that not the case i would i would i've never yet seen a, a court case that was 100 percent certain because yeah, I, I, you know that's the whole litigation is inherently risky for the for those reasons Yes, you you would you would think you, that you would have a a reasonable prospect of of, of success, um, and you know it has to be expedient in the public interest before we would take that case to 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 court anyway. But there is never a guarantee of of there's always that element of of, of risk. But no, if it, if it got to that stage, then the council would have to balance that risk against the ongoing harm. Uh, and that would be a, a, a judgment that we would have to take that in terms of what the most appropriate remedy would, would, would be. So we don't discount injunctions or discount stop notices in extreme circumstances. 
But as Neil said, they're, they're, they're very much the last resort rather than the first resort. But not, I think I sort of think it sounds like it's a case of it's risk versus reward, if I'm right. Not necessarily, because I, I mean, as Gareth said, there is a risk with these. Uh, and unlike a prosecution where there's the sanction, it's criminal sanction, you're looking at a fine. With an injunction, you would be looking at potentially imprisoning somebody for a breach of it. Um, All right. Now, I've done both approaches. And to be honest, people who will, I'm trying to put this diplomatically, mm -hmm. will be awkward in terms of bringing a prosecution are probably going to cause us all sorts of problems if we went for an injunction. And I did have one judge turn around to me, and I know for a fact this, this judge has issued an injunction um, in the Forest of Dean and said he didn't feel that this planning matter should be before him. Um, so it's it's a look at the draw sometimes. Yeah, and again, um, the injunction doesn't necessarily sort of secure the outcome that you that that, that no, you want, as, as Neil was saying. You know, if if they don't comply with the injunction, it's contempt of court, and what happens then is uh, you apply for, to get them committed to prison. He still doesn't get the planning breach remedied. Um, right. So again, you know, you you've, you've got to be careful about what what action you take in and in terms of what outcome you're trying to. To achieve, so I think people think sort of a, you know, some sort of injunction is some sort of panacea in terms of uh, an instant sort of enforcement action, um, but it's not, um, and and it doesn't not, not doesn't necessarily sort of achieve the outcome that you you want in terms of remedying the breach. It might punish the individual, but it doesn't yeah. necessarily get the planning breach remedied. So again, that's something that we have to weigh up in terms of of what the options are. Yeah, by the sounds of it, uh, very complicated and not always very complicated, and uh, <laughs> obviously not a quick fix. Okay, yeah, Catherine, I, guess in, Neil, I, I guess Neil that that is um, you 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 know the situation that we have, you know all the unlawful sites that we have. It was interesting, yeah. actually, <laughs> the majority of your examples <laughs> kind of uh, advertise the fact that we live in a rather uh, difficult um place but so that kind of takes me on to my to to kind of a, a few um um thought provoking questions that, that your okay. presentation gave so in planning i know there's no precedent but i guess the rules and the legislation regulation should really apply across the board but then we see a lot of discrepancies so Interestingly, you put that uh, case up of the um, of the of the unsightly, the the canoes in the garden, and yet we've yeah. got we've got abandoned vehicles on the common, which are just as unsightly and and potentially causing more harm. Um, but you know that that they are not um, dealt with. Um, and we, you know, we kind of we have other um, examples um, of that. Where I mean, the one that came came to mind recently, and, and and well, came to our attention recently. And I guess I can mention it because it's been all over the press. Is this garden centre on the Chepstow Road? So Hulse. So okay. So they they put up two buildings which apparently were without permission. Um, they've had this massive £20,000 fine um, and people are saying, hang about, hang about here. We've got all this going on around us, which we see as real harm to a triple SI. And yet there's a garden centre with a little gift shop and a nice organic veg um, shop. And and they get, you know, they get fined 20000 and to our residents, nothing happens with our cases. And they see that as having much more of a harm to a triple SI than maybe the garden centre case. And, and, and that's just another example. So it's it's really, it, I know, so on the one side, planning doesn't set a precedent, but I would have thought on the other side, where you're looking at legislation regulation, that we, sh 
we, you know, that then all cases should be treated equally. And I just wonder why ours, why our cases are so difficult. Now it might be the, you know, you know the kind of sites that we're dealing with. You know that it's very hard to pin, um, to pin individuals, owners, landowners down. So maybe that is one reason. But we were just really looking for some kind of for you to kind of guide us on some of these discrepancies for want of a better word. I don't think there are discrepancies because we pursued a prosecution at Tonop Hill and that actually was appealed to the Crown Court a few years ago, well, a few years ago, about three years ago. We also pursued a prosecution on against a property on Green Lane and again, these have all gone through and we are exploring other avenues because it isn't always successful and achieve the result that we want. Because as an authority, as I say, covering it, you can see that we're trying to, it's not, it's not about prosecution per se, it's about remedying the harm. Now, some of these individuals, yeah, would probably be an occupational hazard. But as I say, certainly we've got two prosecutions in the Mar uh, sorry, the Peterston area in the last couple of years or so. And I think that covers it. But in terms of, oh, you did say multi-pronged, you queried about derelict cars on the Carmen. Mm. That, again, it's appropriate streams of legislation and I believe there is um, an act that covers the common, um, but potentially, yeah, that would be section 215 as well. So on the cases, the prosecution cases then that have taken place, why, why don't they get publicity? Why don't we know what the outcomes of those were do you know were it were the individuals fined you're on mute neil we've lost you thanks gareth <laughs> on the one case for ton appeal yes they were fined um for the other they actually complied broadly with the notice, so it wasn't expedient to pursue any further. But most of these cases, as you're aware, they're being pursued further. But yeah, we normally let the community councils know the result of cases in their area, service of notices. Um, I would say as an authority, we're probably not best for publicising some of the positive things we do, but generally speaking, yeah, we share the information. Because obviously it's it's also to send a message out to other people. Yeah, we just, you know, you can probably appreciate we, we do struggle when we, you know, when we pick up things like that in the press and then we have probably 5,000 tonnes worth of waste, which has been tipped on a triple SI. Um, and, you know, kind of, but there doesn't uh, seem to be any, <laughs> certainly any fine or... I guess we've got to be careful because that's an ongoing case and it's okay. probably not appropriate to come. We are looking into it and we are pursuing it, but it's probably best we don't go into... Okay too much detail about that I, it's not because i'm avoiding the question i no, think no, i understand i don't want to jeopardize any no thought okay. action with that is that okay julie sorry kath yeah, has been waiting for a for while them. so i'll, I'll yeah, let okay. kath come in now and you can come back later if you need yeah, to kath? Yeah. thank you come on you give us a chance <laughs> <laughs> i was waiting patiently i had my hands up for a while <laughs> i just wanted to know from neil if there was some legislation or policy or protocol he could change to make his job easier, what would it be? Um, well, we suggested a couple of things to the Welsh Government mm -hmm. for the planning enforcement review. 
Um, one, I think, and Gareth will probably agree with me on this, it would be handy if there was a collated act, because at the moment, oh, trying to track it down, it, it, it's difficult for myself. Um, and I know some of the lawyers I've, I've worked with, again, it's problematic. I think what's it, there's a right to refuse to determine an application. <laughs> happy there. Um, <laughs> now that is actually made under an English localism act and it just says substitute Wales. It's it's a nightmare. It's eye water <laughs> trying to work out where the legislation at times I'm following it through just to make sure you're covering yourselves. But that will be the first thing and part of me it's frustrating as residents, but I think we should be accountable to the planning inspectorate. I do think that that is right because they are a reality check. And sometimes, well, I mean, case in point with that appeal, they agreed with us, but I've got to say it wasn't a, a certainty, um, though it went to a public inquiry and it was evidence under oath. And it, there is always a risk. Do you think Welsh Government will um, look at the legislation soon and bring it all into a, you know, under one act or one le one bit of legislation that you're saying that that would make your your job it, a lot easier? It, it would. And I, I think it's the problem of legislation which evolves, though, in all fairness to the Welsh Government. Um, but. I've got to say, I think it's starting to reflect Wales rather than England and Wales as it was. Mm. So there are changes. Um, things like, believe it or not, you can I can serve a notice to get trees replanted, but I can't enforce it under the TPO legislation. Now that that is something we flagged. Because that that would be what's the point of being able to serve a notice? Now that's a hangover from Westminster. But to be honest, there's ways around it. We can serve the box standard enforcement notice, and that can tackle the harm to amenity. So again, we get creative. <laughs> okay, Sorry, yes. thanks, thanks, Neil. Yeah, I just I just get detect that um, your job can be very frustrating not just for yourself, but for the general public as well. Because I don't think people understand, you know, what's going on and, and, and that our job as a community council is to, um, uh, you know, engage with our community, but also to manage their ex expectations. And I think that, you know, when, when we can understand, you know, what's going on, then we can relay that to to our community. And that's why, you know, we asked you last year to come and speak to Marshfield. But the presentation tonight was excellent. So I'd, if we can have your slides, I'd be really grateful. More than welcome to share. Yeah, Neil, if, if you Thank send you. those to the Pam, Pam will circle yeah. it then to all the, all the councillors, not just the ones that are here this evening. Thank yeah, you. That's me, Dan. So, Nathan now. first and then Julie. Nathan? Yeah. Just one very quick question. Um, or maybe not so quick. Um, <laughs> do you work with other councils on like planning issues? Um, say, for example, if they straddle the city boundary, say, for example, if there was a case that sort of straddled between Newport and Caerphilly or Newport and Cardiff, for example, would you work <laughs> with the other, do you work with the other councils to try and, um, uh, resolve planning issues and also do you um, look at how other councils have um, dealt with uh, planning issues that Newport hasn't had but maybe could come across in the future? This is actually a very topical question. Um, there's a case that where I'm liaising with Cardiff now. Now in terms of the appropriate um, body to deal with it, if it was if it's literally straddled about a, a boundary, that would be both authorities. But in most cases, it's one or the other. 
um, you do consult with the adjoining authority. And in this particular case with Cardiff, I've got pretty good rapport with their enforcement officer. And they're basically supporting us in our action, but they needed to be aware of it because potentially it could extend. Well, the boundary is only 80 metres away. So, uh, yeah, you can see the risk there. We've also got. Bear with me a moment. Tell me a second. Ah, have we have we oh, lost? Yeah. I think I've scared him off. Have we lost? It must <laughs> be the question, Nathan. Nathan. <laughs> I think we'll he's give him a couple of seconds to see if Neil can rejoin us. I think he probably cut himself off when he was trying to unmute, actually. <laughs> Julie, that's all your fault. Yeah, there we are. Oh, thank you, Pat. <laughs> We are, you're back with us, Neil. Just need one mute. That was the joys of working at home. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, in terms of um, something I took up from trading standards when I used to work there, there is like a regional body. Now we've got an informal group for South East Wales for planning enforcement, and we ask questions to see if anybody has got experience in a different area. And we draw on that. There is also um, body. I'm a member of the Royal Town Planning Institute, but we've got National Association of Planning Enforcement and they circulate case law and best practice. So we try to, to share ideas. Um, I'm going to say in Newport, we we probably, yeah, we'll try novel approach at the times, like the community protection notice, because they attract significantly higher fines, I found, for unsightly land cases. I think partly because it's viewed as antisocial behaviour rather than a planning breach. So open to suggestions. But one thing I think I would like to say is, is groups like this have really helped because I mean, I look at Parade and Peterston, it's got us talking to other bodies and that's really useful. It's that sharing of information, it, it's really key. Um, and I think that collaborative approach, it's helped for the police, Natural Resources Wales, other departments within the authority as well. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, I think that's answered it quite thoroughly. And Thank yeah, I, I'm not sure if I scared you off with the, the complexity of oh, it. It was, it was worth oh. waiting for the answer, Nathan. There we are. <laughs> Thank you. I've got to say, my son was running down the corridor. <laughs> <laughs> Julie, have you got a question or is that a... Yeah, house. no, no, it's not a legacy hand. All oh, I was all going right. to say was I'm a bit disappointed, Neil, that you didn't uh, when you answered Kat's question, you didn't say more staff would have been really <laughs> no, <laughs> beneficial <laughs> and helpful. In all fairness, actually, that is it is a good point. It's above my pay grade. Um, <laughs> but cut, cutbacks have meant that we have to really target on those cases that, that matter. And Newport, we've got um, a new planning officer starting an enforcement. Um, it's not for everyone, so we've got quite a turnover <laughs> nature of the work. Um, Gemma James, now she's starting, I believe, 1st of November. And we've got a temporary planning enforcement officer in who's ex-Met um, Police Force. All right. And again, what we do is tackle some of the significant issues because um, we do appreciate it, but it has been, yeah, uh, tackling the more egregious breaches, I guess. 
And just finally for me, I'd like to say what a wonderful job you do. We really do, we're extremely grateful for all the help. And um, we will try and support you as much as we can, but you do a fantastic job and we're really thankful. It's much appreciated, thank you. It's nice to hear that. There we are, Neil. You can't get a much higher commendation than that. It was probably <laughs> worth doing the presentation just for that reaction in the end. You know, and clearly you haven't bored people because of the number of questions that they've been asking you. And can I just yeah. say, he's re uh, Neil is really good at judging a Christmas bauble competition for primary <laughs> age children in Marshfield. And I would like to I invite I would <laughs> like to invite Neil to judge this year's competition. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how could he possibly refuse? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you put him on the spot now in a public <laughs> meeting, so there we are. That's probably the most difficult thing I've to do, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, planning enforcement is so much easier compared with that, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> if I got it wrong, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> but, Any mean, other questions what? now before we, we let Neil go? No? Oh. OK, thank in you, that Neil. case, Neil, thank you very much. It's been really informative, very helpful. Thank you, Neil. Um, you know, I hope to and uh, on behalf of everyone, thank you for giving up your time. Thank you. Yes. Well, thank you. I'd like to reiterate what you said. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, Neil. Thank, much thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Right. Um, any other business? We. I don't think... We've had any notice of any issues that, that the community councils wanted to raise specifically. So there's nothing on the agenda. But was there anything that? Oh, Kath, there we are, Kath. <laughs> <laughs> Just where you thought it was safe. On <laughs> yes, you do know about it, um, Gareth. I emailed in about the transport committee. Um, we've had a bus campaign in Marshfield that started back in March, and we're not moving forward with it at all and um i just wondered if we could have um on one of these meetings somebody who deals with transport here is that possible well i give you i i, I think i replied to pam and she sent that that, yes, that because there, there isn't a transport committee that's the first thing well, we've I got a cabinet member who deals with strategic transport but that doesn't involve bus routes necessarily. Yeah. There's a limit to what the council does in terms of public public transport. So there may be the occasional sort of subsidised routes that we put out to tender, the non-commercial routes, but otherwise the routes are down to the uh, the bus companies, the, the commercial operators. Um, so it depends what you want somebody to talk to you about, really, in terms of transport issues. Well, it's just if this, um issue doesn't go away um it's just we we've we've consulted we've done community engagement or so the group has um done community engagement we've done over 500 questionnaires we produced and printed had it professionally printed a document that was presented to the councillors our three city councillors and um Basically, uh, they met with New Newport Transport Limited and um, NCC, and our problem is we don't who who is the ultimate decision maker for um, we in Marshfield. The community want a proper scheduled bus to serve the village instead of the DRT because we just yeah. find that the DRT is so inconvenient for people unless she retired that um and, and with the emphasis on you know the environment getting people out of their cars there's no way to get from marshall village to the main road to catch uh, a th number 30 bus that goes to cardiff and newport and there is there is the will in the village that they want you know the community wants a bus service but we, um, we've spoken to Morgan Stevens, who's head of Newport Transport Limited, and he said it's not his, in his gift to give. So we were confused of who, who is the ultimate decision maker, that if, if 
that we want to negotiate with to see if we can get a proper scheduled bus service. If it's a you scheduled know, bus, bus service, that is Newport Transport or one of the other bus operators because the council does not pay for um, bus services. That that was that was uh, it, the whole feel, thing was deregulated years ago in, in terms of all the council does is commissions the odd sort of uh, non-commercial service subsidised route where the, the bus operators won't run them commercially. Now, if you want a proper um, standard bus service operating in Marshfield, that is a commercial decision for Newport Transport or one of the other bus operators. But the council couldn't do anything about that. Well, it's not within our power to, to decide that. Well, Morgan Stephen says it's not within his power to to decide that. It's, it's NCC. So we're, we're having oh, right, the this ball. Makes, right. OK, I, I think Richard Cope, who's the, um, the transport manager, is the person to, to speak to about that. And he'll clarify what what the position is, but but um, you know, I, it probably doesn't justify a presentation at one of these meetings because it sounds like it, it it's just an issue, you know, for yourselves in 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 Marshfield. But if you just want information as to um, you know, who's got the final decision on that? Yeah, that's what. Right, uh, Richard Cope. If you email Richard Cope, who's the um, the transport manager. Right. Um, he will deal with with all things transport, but it wouldn't be something that the cabinet member would would decide. Um, so Richard can explain to you so, what routes the council can subsidise and, and what is just a commercial decision then for the bus operators. So is Richard Cope an employee of Newport City Council? Yes. Thank well, you. he's jointly employed by us and Monmouthshire. We have a joint uh, passenger transport unit. Um, ourselves in Monmouthshire, but but yeah, Richard has got a, a council email address. So if you yes, email him at the usual council address, you should. Uh, we have should been emailing him and copying him into everything, but okay. we we don't get any reply. Okay, well Pam and I will chase that up with uh, with his head of service and see if we can get you a, a reply on that one. Thank you very Is that much. Okay. Yep, that's perfect. No problem. Uh, Julie, is that a no? That was that a legacy hand or is that? No, mine is a legacy hand. Sorry. I oh, you... there we are then. <laughs> so, yeah. is there any other any other business anyone wants to to raise? Do you want to come and judge the Christmas bauble competition? <laughs> well, I may have more, some, some more time on my hands because if you, if there's if there's if no one else has got any other business to raise, there were a couple of things I had to announce at the end. Or um, Yvonne. I just wanted to ask what was happening at the next meeting. What's happening at the next meeting? As in, in, in what, what's on the agenda, agenda for the next oh. meeting? Right, OK. Pam, have we got anything in terms um, of, of presentations in the nothing offing? Nothing at the moment, but I usually um, circulate an email around to all the community council to, you know, to find out whether they have any agenda items. Okay. Um, but just to let all of the community councils know that my um, colleague Taylor is also on the meeting this evening because this is my last community councils meeting. Taking a minute. Oh, she Aww. stole my thunder there. <laughs> Pam, I just want to make that announcement Aww. and say this Aww. is going to be a last meeting. So um, we have a joint one, haven't we, Gareth? <laughs> there we are. Um, so yeah, just on behalf of everyone, can I thank Pam for all her hard work? in terms of organising these meetings. Um, and as she said, she'll be handing over the reins now to her colleague, Taylor, who's on the call, who I assume, Pam, will also be the, the point of contact in future for community council clerks. So if you've got any inquiries, Taylor Strange, who's on the um, on the call, and one of our governance officers, he will, uh, he'll be your point of contact in future instead of Pam. But, but you still get the same, on, the same leave. exceptional service, won't they, Pam? Yeah, absolutely. And if, if Taylor's on leave or anything, just just give me a bell. If you need anything, you know, it's absolutely fine to still email me if you need anything. OK, thanks. I, won't be, too, I won't be too far away. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to steal your thunder, Gareth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, so in terms of presentations, I think, you know, we had that one from Neil that was a legacy from from previous meetings. But there's 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 nothing else. I don't think that that's outstanding in terms of 
of what you've asked for as a community council in terms of presentations from council offices. So you've got between now and well, January when the next agenda goes out. If you've got any requests, any burning issues, topics that are, are common to to all of you and you'd like a presentation from any council offices, then uh, um, then just let Taylor know. Um, um, sorry, um, we, can, okay. we can sort that out. OK. okay. Yeah. Do you um, need perhaps we can get together? To discuss. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. Um, I was just going to ask, that reminded me, Gareth, sorry, that I was going to ask about um, the Code of Conduct training. Um, right. Was there still an offer to do Code of Conduct training for new councillors and refresher for old councillors? <laughs> right, well it, well, it was an open invitation last time, but I sort of got the impression from, from the discussion last time that, that, that many councillors had had the, the training from One Voice Wales and um and obviously we, we we sent some slides around last time just as a stopgap but yes i mean if 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 councillors still feel that there's a a need for some training then then just let us know and and we can we can organize that for you okay i i say we sorry okay. and I, I keep delaying my final announcement which is the fact that this will be my last meeting um oh, because okay. i'm i'm retiring in december no. Oh, so you'll yes. have the pleasure of somebody else chairing these meetings oh, come January. Oh my goodness. Oh, I know, it's terrible news. <laughs> no, they're all celebrating, yeah? No, and that's really good so, news for you. Yeah, I'll, I'll be sorry to not to chair these meetings anymore, but yeah, on a personal note, can I just thank you all for your, your support over the years, not just in, in attending these meetings, but in terms of all the communications that we've that we've had and, and working together on that charter as well. So it, yeah, it's been a, a really good experience for me. Hopefully I'm the same for you. On your toes. Absolutely. Always <laughs> a challenge, Nathan. Well, but, let's um, see you and have great yeah, so, congratulations for your upcoming retirement. Thank you very much indeed. I guess so it's I early don't know, retirement. Sorry? <laughs> I guess it's early retirement. God no, it's very late retirement. Oh really? Oh, oh absolutely. Well, yeah, look, I, I, I intended going probably 18 months ago, but but what with COVID and and other things and the elections um you know i've always agreed to carry on until after the elections and the, and the induction training but uh yeah now is probably the best time to to go so it's it's not early at all oh. um far from it um, yeah, oh before I anyone asks me in terms of my plans i've got no plans of offering my services as a clerk to the community councils i can tell you <laughs> that would be possible on my list of things to do with retirement you could come and be a judge. What's that? Christmas <laughs> global competition. Oh, I could do that. Yeah, Kat. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, I'll put my there. Although, you know, <laughs> that would be stealing Neil Gunter's thunder a little bit, wouldn't it? Given he looks over it too, yeah, yeah so much. That is not second best, Kat. <laughs> but there we are. Anyway, anyway, well, thank you all for your patience and understanding you. and thanks for your well, support. Thank you, Gareth. And oh, I wish you all a happy Christmas. Way. Hang on, yeah. hang on, hang on. Oh, hang on, Nathan. Um, I know I mentioned uh, just before we started about um, having hybrid meetings. Would um, other councillors be up for that? Yeah. Where we, where we meet up. Uh, some of us can meet up in the um, in the uh, committee room if we wanted to, but yeah. um, still have the option to join remotely if um, others wanted to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, look, if there's enthusiasm Absolutely. for that, like we like we said, you know, Nathan and whoever will be chairing the meeting in January, I sorry, Nathan yeah. and Taylor and whoever they you know will 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 book a room. Um and we can sort the screens out for you and, and yeah, we can we can do that. Who will chair the meeting in January? I don't know at the moment. Um exactly. if they haven't got a new head of law and standards in place by then, then it'll probably be either Liz Bryant who's my deputy, the assistant uh, head of legal services, or possibly Leanne Rowlands, who's on the call, so she can't deny it, who's the <laughs> um, democratic <laughs> services and uh, an elections manager. So one of them might have to step into the breach in, in January. There's Leanne. Oh, you can go off somebody, Gareth, I tell you. Well, <laughs> I can see you on the call there, so I just want to apologies. introduce you. But there we I are. joined late, so apologies, everybody. I didn't want no, to no problem. come in and interrupt your, your presentation with Neil. Yeah, but so it, it'll probably be either Leanne or, uh, or Liz that will have the pleasure of, of, of chairing that meeting. OK. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Uh, Thanks, Thank you ever so much for all your um, service, not only no, to us, but, but to all the citizens of uh, the city of Newport. 
Thank you for those kind words. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. So I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll declare the meeting to a close now and um, wish you all all a Merry Christmas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.